Public Theology. Welcome to Coffee and Thinking. Well, we're going to try and answer that question. Stay tuned. And welcome to our query. We're going to try to answer the question, what is public theology? And while answering it, I'm going to sip my French roast. What do you like to put in your cup? I am of the conviction that when the Christian theologian thinks rationally thinks about what the Bible says and what the meaning and significance of Christian beliefs are, that this theological thinking process is valuable not just to the church, but to those outside the church as well, to the wider culture, to the wider society. Why? Because there's wisdom, wisdom that has grown up over the centuries through Christian reflection. I think there are some enigmas about human existence and human living that this accumulated Christian wisdom could provide explanations for, better explanations than we find in other academic disciplines or common sense and definitely better than the ideologies that are competing for our attention on the internet and in the public square. Public theology. Faith seeking understanding, fides quarens into intellectum, as St. Augustine would say. And in this case, understanding in the form of an explanation that spills beyond the borders of the church and provides something of value and significance for the wider world. So to that, I'm going to toast. Join me for coffee and thought. First, I can recommend for keeping up the International Journal of Public Theology. Kim, professor at Fuller Seminary, is the former editor of the International Journal of Public Theology, and here he is with Katie Day, professor at United Seminary in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. They offer an answer to our question, what is public theology? Public theology refers to the church referring Reflectively, that's Fides Quarens Intellectum, as St. Augustine said. Public theology refers to the church reflectively engaging with those within and outside its institutions on issues of common interest for the common good. So it's not just theology, it's ethics as well. It is reasonable to describe the theology of Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement as a form of public theology. In addition to the Bible, the Holy Scripture was the Bill of Rights in the U.S. Constitution. And the thrust of M.L. King's public rhetoric was to call all Americans black and white to authentic loyalty and faithfulness to 
the doctrine of human equality there in the Constitution. Black public theology continues. It looks like Fuller Seminary is the center from which it emanates. What systematic theologian Paul Chung says, public theology is a theological philosophical endeavor to provide a broader frame of reference to facilitate the responsibility of the church and theological ethics for social, political, economic, and cultural issues. It investigates public issues, developing conceptual clarity. I'm going to call that discourse clarification. For developing conceptual clarity and providing social ethical guidance of religious conviction and response to them. Oh, for the current discussion of public theology begins with David Tracy. David, a Roman Catholic fundamental and systematic theologian, University of Chicago, and my doctor father, he supervised my PhD dissertation. Did I learn anything from David? Oh, yes, I did. I don't always footnote him, but you'll hear a lot of David's thoughts coming through my voice. One of David's contributions to the present discussion is the distinction between three publics. The theologian, first of all, is embedded within the church and talks to the church. It's also the case that theology is the academic face of the Christian faith. And so the academy, the university, is a place where Christian thoughts get bombarded by critiques from all the other academic disciplines. Christian thinking gets cleaned up, so to speak, from the messiness that might otherwise slip by if it stayed within the church and didn't become subject to external criticism. So the first public is the church, the second is the academy, the third is the wider culture. We're going to say more about that, but David believes that what the theologian thinks about within the church could be a valuable value to people outside the church. So the word public uh, can mean two things. It could refer to any one of these three audiences. And sometimes I cheat a little bit. I mean by public, the wider culture. Listen carefully and don't let me get away with ambiguity. uh, Public theology to systematic theology. Systematic theology, you will see as we proceed is the treatment of the full round of Christian beliefs roughly in the order that we find them in the Apostles or Nicene Creeds. The system is divided into three parts, one for each person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the first article, we get God and creation. In the second article, we get the person and work of Jesus Christ. 
in the third article, we get the Holy Spirit and then everything else that we didn't think about. Church, eschatology, sacraments. Then we have an epilogomena, ethics and the Christian life. But let's go up here to the prolegomena. Most of the time for the prolegomena, I use the word methodology, but you could call it propedeutic. It goes by many names. The task of the theologian up here is to take the first word of the creeds, the Apostles of Nicene Creed, credo, I believe. What does it mean to believe? Whoa. That is not a simple question to answer. I won't work on that answer right now. What I want to point out is that for Protestant theologians, methodology will include philosophical theology. That is to say, the philosophical theologian raises questions of knowledge, epistemology. How is it that we know anything about God so that we can believe in it? If you are a Roman Catholic theologian such as David Tracy, it's going to be called Fundamental theology, do not confuse Roman Catholic fundamental theology with Protestant fundamentalism. There is no relationship whatsoever. Protestant fundamentalism has to do with the interpretation of Scripture and whether or not you like Darwinian evolution. And fundamental theology is the Roman Catholic counterpart to the Protestant philosophical theology. It deals with natural revelation. And both of these, philosophical theology and fundamental theology, deal with the broad questions of human knowing and justification of human knowledge. And they do not depend on special revelation in Scripture. Apologetic theology, we're going to come back to this because apologetic theology is one form of public theology. That is to say, apologetic theology presents the Christian faith to the non-believer. So in general, with some exceptions. I want to say thinking about public theology belongs up here in the prolegomena. But I will make a point later that some explications of Christian doctrine provide wisdom and insight that people outside the church can benefit from, especially Theological anthropology, the Christians have learned a lot about human nature. The Christians have a lot of insight into human nature. And these insights, sometimes when shared outside the church and the wider society, provide illumination that can't come At least it can't come as strongly from any other source. So one of the primary responsibilities of the public theologian is to share what Christian theologians have learned about human nature to others who might benefit. Brazilian scholar Renata Jacobson does us all a favor in her valuable article that appeared in the International Journal of Public Theology called Models of Public Theology. She recognizes that the tradition of public theology that most of us work with uh, begins with uh, Reinhold Niebuhr and that torch gets 
past to Martin Marty at the University of Chicago and to David Tracy. And it fans out to Ronald Teeman at Harvard, Max Stackhouse at Princeton, and of course, many others in the subsequent generation. There is no one single program called public theology. And so what Dr. Jacobson does is look at the broad scope of the literature and then provide categories. He believes there are at least six coherent conceptual models for public theology, and she divides those into two broader categories, the foundational models and the action models, I think it's worth our while to take a few moments and just follow the roadmap that Anita Jacobson is providing for us here. Foundational models. The first one, disclosure, is driven by God. God wants to be disclosed. You know, our definition of the gospel is that the gospel is good news. There's got to be someone who spreads the good news and someone who hears it. And so public theology would be a version of that. Jürgen Moltmann, the theologian of eschatology and hope and a political theologian, says that our task is to take as our point of reference not the church, but the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is universal. The church is made up of only that group of people who witness to the kingdom of God. What does public mean? in the disclosure model. It means clear and manifest. What we say about God is not secret or esoteric. What we say about God has validity and value for anyone and everyone. The gospel is disclosure disclosure oriented by its very nature and its definition. That's model one. Uh, let's take a look briefly at the next five. Model two, universality. Jacobson's example here is David Tracy. For Tracy, the public character of theology is anchored in the nature of religious questions, or what I would call existential questions, that are faced by any human being or society, and to which the theologians seek to provide answers. The question of the meaning of existence and the possibility of a fundamental trust in God amid the fears of life would be, according to Tracy, examples of questions that, given their universality, require the public nature of Christian theology. The public, in this case, is the wider culture. Remember, Tracy distinguished between three publics for the theologian, the church, the academy, and the wider culture. We're talking now about the wider culture. As a Roman Catholic theologian, Tracy does what's called fundamental theology, and this belongs in the category we call methodology or prolegomena or propedeutic, getting ready to do theology, what is important here is that the reasons that ground the faith, this is a foundational model, that ground the faith are open to anybody universally. We'll say more about fundamental theology later. That is model two, universality. 
So why does Jacobson assign the term factual here? Because religion is a fact. The public existence of religion, and by extension, the public existence of theology is taken for granted. In other words, the crucial issue for public theology is not the question of publicizing the faith, but the critical analysis of the way in which the faith is already being made public is our concern here. Ron Tiemann, former dean at the Divinity School at Harvard, wants to remind us that the moral decisions you and I make as individuals is going to have a big impact on the wider public, the moral character of our political leaders, our business leaders, our sports heroes. Their individual moral character has an impact on the general public. Max Stackhouse at prison, uh, at prison, not prison, Princeton. <laughs> Max Stackhouse at Princeton Theological Seminary, who worked on public theology for decades, wanted to make the point that you and I will have a personal religious faith, but that faith is in a God who is the God of everybody. In fact, God, the God of the cosmos. This idea that somehow or other in modern democracy that you can make religion a private matter, right? Keep it out of the public square. Impossible, says Stackhouse, because you and my personal faith is public in the widest sense of the word, public in scope. So factual here is going to simply acknowledge the religious factor that already exists in the wider public. That's model three. We will now depart the foundational models and go to the action models or the actualization models. The action models are characterized by answering the question as to in what way it is possible or necessary to proceed so that the publicity of theology is reached by addressing different audiences, sticking to the issues at stake in society, being a contextual and politically, politically militant theology, or through dialogue in the public sphere. The answers to these questions determine the models of public theology identified as distinct perspectives of acting. So we've got three of them, the audience model, the apologetic model, and the contextual model. Let's take a look here then at the uh, audience model. Uh, David Tracy, recall, had talked about the three basic publics of the systematic theologian, uh, the church, the academy, and the wider culture. Now within the wider culture outside the church, that culture is divided into three realms, the techno-economic structure, the political realm, and the cultural realm more generally. He's adding a little bit of specificity to the broad category of culture. So the church here is going to be the community of moral discourse within which the theologian is embedded. The thoughts of the theologian will be refined critically in the university and then finally addressed to the wider public with those three realms. That is the first of the three actions. Model number five, the apologetic model responding to the biblical dictum that we ought to be able to give good reasons for our faith to 
the public outside the church, the apologetic model is based on the assumption that theology can be articulated in a universal manner, in a way accessible to anyone using methods of reasoning accepted by all. The apologetic model is opposed to a dogmatic and confessional stance, and so does not resort to authority or faith assumptions. So it is interesting that, according to Jacobson, confessional theology or dogmatic theology is the church talking to the church. When the church talks outside the church, then good reasons acceptable to all reasoning people must be appealed to and not merely what uh, would appear arbitrary, namely a confession of faith. That is the apologetic model. Finally, number six, the contextual model. Jacobson takes the universal foundational model and the apologetic action model and pits them against the contextual model. They are incompatible. Why? Because for the contextual theologians, the local cultural zitzim leben or uh, social location actually determines what gets said theologically. <laughs> Juan Luis Segundo is a Brazilian liberation theologian, and the specific context of poverty and oppression actually determines what gets said theologically. It's the liberation hermeneutic on Segundo's part. John de Grouchy was a very important theologian during the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. He actually adapted the public theology of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German, to the anti-apartheid situation in South Africa. It is the specificity of the needs of the context which dominate the contextual model. So theology, or at least public theology, is not universal. It is local. Well, here you have it. Five options, three foundational, three actual or action-oriented models. Should we have an election? Which one do you vote for? Well, here is Ted's handy-dandy definition. Public theology is conceived in the church, reflected on critically in the academy, and meshed within the wider culture for the benefit of the wider culture. As you can see, the three publics of David Tracy are present here. And I must identify to some degree with the universal and apologetic models that we just looked at. Public theology conceived in the church, reflected on in the academy, and addressed to the wider culture, there will be five tasks. Pastoral, apologetic, a theology of nature, political theology, and prophetic theology. We'll take a moment or two and look at each one of these tasks. The first task is pastoral theology. 
In our list of three foundational models, one was the universal model, which presupposes, as I presuppose, that human beings in all times and in all places ask existential questions. It, this is the to be or not to be question of Hamlet. Usually it takes the form of meaning. What is the meaning of my life? What is the meaning of my life in relationship to my local community, to the world, to one another, and finally to God? All human beings ask existential questions. The Christian gospel is intended to offer theological answers. It's the job of the church theologian as well as the public theologian to formulate answers that meet existential questions. Paul Tillich calls this the method of correlation. What's important here is the universal applicability of the pastoral task of public theology. It is the task of apologetic theology, says Paul Tillich, to prove that the Christian claim also has validity from the point of view of those outside the theological circle. Traditionally, apologetic theology belongs to the Christian mission, the wider mission of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have said and contend that much of what we do as a public theologian is to provide wisdom, understanding, and explanation for the benefit of the wider culture, not necessarily to persuade others to join the Christian church. During the economic depression, World War II, and especially in the decades following World War II, two public theologians dominated the American scene. They were Reinhold Niebuhr and Paul Tillich, both professors at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Both made the cover of Time magazine that indicates that the secular sphere went to these Christian intellectuals to gain wisdom and understanding that applies to the secular sphere. Reinhold Niebuhr picks up what John Calvin had observed, namely that you and I do not understand ourselves as human beings truly unless we understand ourselves in relationship to a gracious God. So Niebuhr develops this. Man does not know himself truly, except as he knows himself confronted by God. Only in that confrontation does he become aware of his full stature and freedom and of the evil in him. It is for this reason that biblical faith is of such importance for the proper understanding of man. I have said, you'll hear me say it again, Christian anthropology has something of value for the secular culture beyond the church. disciple of Paul Tillich and his student Langdon Gilkey on the theology of culture. The Tillichian maxim, well worth 
memorizing, I might add. Culture is the form of religion, and religion is the substance of culture. When Tillich uses the word religion, and in most cases when I use the word religion, I'm not referring to what people do when they go to church or the institutions of religious organizations. No, we're talking about the substance of culture which gives expression to underlying existential and religious foundations. The theologian of culture looks at art and music and especially tradition, public institutions such as politics and economics, trade, and especially education. What we want to do is plummet the depths of culture to find the religious substance that underpins it. So when you hear a Tolikian or even Ted Peters talking about religion, most of the time we're not talking about church. No, no, we're talking about the substance of culture. Langdon Gilkey, my professor at the University of Chicago, a strong disciple of both Paul Tillich and Reinhold Niebuhr, and Tillich taught me, and I learned it, that religion is the substance of culture. Now that could get us into significant trouble. Let me report on how Gilkey as a public theologian got into trouble, at least in my opinion. 1984, Arkansas. There is a battle in the courts over whether or not creationism can be taught as a science in the public school system. Creation is a theory that denies Darwinian evolution based on scientific evidence. Oh, later on in this semester, we're going to take a look at the battle over Darwinian evolution and warriors such as the biblical creationists, the scientific creationists, and all kinds of others all dressed for battle. In this case, it is the scientific creationists who argue on scientific grounds that the Genesis account of creation is correct and the story told by the Darwinian evolutionists is incorrect. Therefore, said the creationists, the true science must be taught in the public schools. Oh, big battle in the courts. Those who wanted to eliminate creationism from science classes in the public schools claimed that the creationists were religious and because they were religious, teaching in the public schools would violate the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Langdon Gilkey, public theologian expert on the relationship between faith and science, as I think about it, it was probably Gilkey that inspired me to go into the field of theology and science. So Langdon Gilkey was called as an expert witness in Little Rock, Arkansas. Dr. Gilkey, the attorneys asked, do you think that the creationists are religious? Yes, I do, he said. Well, that was enough 
to indict the creationists. The creationists lost in this trial on the grounds that they were violating the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Judge Overton made that ruling and it stopped. It was uh, a ruling of nationwide consequence because it stopped the movement to bring scientific creationism into the public school system. Well, let's think a little bit about that trial. Dr. Gilkey, is creationism religious? Yes, it is. Now, lawyers know that the way we interpret the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is in sectarian form. That is to say, the U.S. government cannot give preference for or against religion in its sectarian form. That is to say, you can't prefer Presbyterians over Baptists. Give one a tax break and deny it to the other. You can't do that. Now, what none of the attorneys knew, they were completely oblivious to, was that Langdon Gilkey was a student of Paul Tillich on the theology of culture in which religion is understood as the substance of culture. So Gilkey said, well, yeah, creationism is religious, but, you know, everything else in culture is religious. Had they asked Gilkey this question, do you think that evolutionary science is religious? His answer would have been, well, yes, of course. <laughs> Because evolutionary science is an aspect of culture, just like scientific creationism is. They didn't ask him that question. So there was an ambiguity here. <laughs> Gilkey meant one thing by religion. The court thought something different. A court trial, a uh, court verdict actually hinged on on large part, on Gilkey's testimony, and uh, there was an ambiguity about the nature of religion, and the court decision went one way instead of another. Well, be that as it may, I like thinking about religion as the substance of culture, but... If I were in Gilkey's shoes, I probably would not have given exactly the testimony that he gave, he gave. But you know what? He didn't ask my opinion. Whether the world knows it or not, it is crying out for a theology of nature. It is, it is crying out for an understanding, an explanation of nature because Humpty Dumpty is falling apart. Nobody knows how to put it back together again. The planet seems to be in the death throes, losing its ability to sustain life as we know it. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, reaffirms that the warming of the climate system is unequivocal and that it is extremely likely that the human influence has been the dominant cause, the anthropogenic cause. That is to say, our planet is self-destructing if you think of the human race as part of the self belonging to the planet. To theologians that understand nature as part of God's creation, do theologians have anything of wisdom or enlightenment for this crisis moment? I do not mean the traditional natural theology. By natural theology, we usually mean that outside the Bible, there is a revelation of God. 
theology of nature combines our scientific understanding of the natural world with the biblical revelation. Here's Celia Dean Drummond, one of the world's leading scholars in the field of theology and science. She has two PhDs, one in biology and the other in theology. A theology of nature, says Celia, is appropriate as long as it is suitably qualified by a proper attention to reveal theology, both Science and scripture are needed for a theology of nature. What Celia has done is make clear that Christian theology needs to rely upon a revelational base in scripture and then interpret scripture in light of what we learn about the natural world in natural science. What about going the other direction? Is it possible that what we learn about the natural world in natural science might actually affect, alter, and influence the way the theologian explicates and interprets the biblical symbols? Here in this book, God is Trinity, I explore the possibility that Einstein's uh, special theory of relativity could influence the way we understand the perichoresis within the divine trinity, the ability of God to unify disparate things. Regardless of the success or failure of my attempt to integrate science into theology, the important point is this. As we develop a theology of nature, the theologian should allow what we learn about nature from science to influence what what it is that we say about God's relationship to the world. A theology of nature. The Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences likes the bridge metaphor. Here's the Golden Gate Bridge. On the one end, we have theology. On the other hand, we have natural science. We want to connect those two. You could say that theology and science is a sub-discipline within public theology. Here's Bob Russell, who has given the world the concept of creative mutual interaction, or CMI. That is to say, the traffic goes both directions on that bridge from science to theology and theology to science. What is going on in our culture? In the face of the overwhelming challenge of COVID-19, we are turning to science for our soteriology. Science will save the world. Really? Might the public theologian operating out of a theology of nature have something to say of value to the wider culture on this question? Should we put our trust in science to bring us salvation? Frankly, I hope science saves us. Be that as it may,
there ought to be a theological analysis based upon the theology of culture that will help illuminate why the existential need for salvation comes to expression in the hope that science can be our savior. The prophetic task of the public theologian is to keep in mind that the symbol of the kingdom of God brought solely by God's power and grace stands in judgment over against all pretenders to establish that perfect society here in time and place, Reinhold Niebuhr articulates the heart and center of the prophetic mind when he deals with church and state. The most striking contemporary form of the demonic the demonic, okay, now, he's lived through World War I, World War II, the Great Depression, and most importantly, fascism in Germany, in Italy, and in Japan. Fascism is demonic. The most striking contemporary form of the demonic is a religious nationalism, okay? Nationalism looks like it's politics, but if you use Tillich's theology of culture, to which Niebuhr also subscribed, nationalism is a religious phenomenon. The most striking contemporary form of the demonic is a religious nationalism in which race and nation assume the eminence of God. Think of Luther's commentary in the First Commandment in the Large Catechism. The heart and the soul establish both God and idol. Assume the eminence of God and demand the unconditioned devotion. That's the problem. Unconditioned devotion to El Duce, to the leader. This absolute claim, that's where the problem lies, this absolute claim for something which is not absolute identifies the possessing spirit as demonic. Fascism in Germany, Italy, and Japan were demonic for the public theologian of today. The prophetic sensibility is to look for absolute claims that come from the state. Those will be demonic. Thank you. 
By prophetic, it sounds strictly negative. That is to say, the prophetic voice pronounces judgment against absolute claims or demands for unconditioned loyalty. But there's a dialectic to the prophetic. It begins actually with a vision of the future, a vision of the kingdom of God, a vision of harmony in nature, a vision of justice in society, a vision of fulfillment and human flowering, and then renders judgment against faults substitutes. Lifting up a vision of what a just society would look like, that's part of the prophet's task as well. The line between the church and the wider society is not a sharp one. Every member of our church is also a member of the wider culture. So when we sing prophetically in church, we're engaging in public theology as well. When race and class cry out for treason, when sirens call for war, they overshout the voice of reason and scream till we ignore all we held dear before. The voice of the prophet in the church and in the wider public. Political theology. I want to approach political theology with the prophetic disposition we just looked at in Reinhold Niebuhr, but I want to add the eschatological proviso, that is to say, the New Testament symbols of God's eschatological transformation include political symbols such as the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God promises a future in which all persons in creation will live together with one another in harmony, needless to say, in justice and mutual support for the fulfillment and the flowering for all the citizens of God's kingdom. That is the standard by which we measure all temporal attempts to establish the perfect society. The proviso keeps that prophetic judgment ever alert to demonstrate the shortfalls of temporal attempts to establish eternal harmony. The task of the church, according to Johannes B. Metz, one of the three eschatological political theologians of the late 1960s, there was Johannes B. Metz, Jürgen Moltmann, and Wolfhard Pannenberg, three Germans, all with strong eschatologies, all who tried to make the vision of the coming kingdom of God actualized in political rhetoric and in the political belief that revolution and transformation could lead to an improved democratic society. These theologians of hope fed what would later become the liberation theology of Latin America. Here is Metz, Roman Catholic, when the church, church, when the church is faced with the modern political systems, she must emphasize her critical, so the church is going to speak critically, 
to the world outside the church. Liberating function, that is a political task on the part of the church. The church must emphasize her critical liberating function again and again to make clear that human history as a whole stand under God's eschatological proviso. The positive part is the vision that we want through revolution to transform society to make it better than the way it has been, but at the same time, to recognize that if it falls short, the kingdom of God will stand in judgment. So Metz, hopeful that political change can lead to a better society, still like Reinhold Niebuhr and his prophetic sensibility, recognizes that if we fall short, it is still God's kingdom of God that sets the standard by which we measure the successful, if not the perfect, society. Well, that was a half century ago. What about the political dimension to public theology today? Here's Hak Jun Lee. Public theology advocates for a constructive public role for religious discourse in a pluralistic society, neither suppressing religious expressions, nor dismissing democratic values such as human rights, tolerance, and equality. So Dr. Lee wants the pu public theologian to contribute to politics, affirming Western liberal values such as democratic values, human rights, tolerance, and equality. Karl Barth probably will not be invited to barbecues held by public theologians. He deliberately named his magnum opus the Church Dogmatics and the Grounds that the circle of faith, beginning with God's revelation to which we humans respond in faith, is the Church thinking and talking to itself. He's a church theologian. He is not a public theologian. Nevertheless, when the crisis hit Europe in the 1930s with the rise of Nazism, and those with insight could read the writing on the wall that totalitarianism, genocide, and war were on the horizon, Karl Barth did not stay in the church. Well, not exactly. It depends on how you interpret it. He, along with a number of other theologians, met and Barth was the principal author of what's called the Barman Declaration of 1934, which stated that these Christians affirm that Jesus Christ and only Jesus Christ commands absolute loyalty. No fascist political leader, no racial identity, no patriotism, no nationalism can 
ever replace our loyalty to God's presence in Jesus Christ. And that led to the birth of the Bekenendekirka, the Confessing Church. Those were the leaders who opposed Nazism, Hitlerism, and the Third Reich. In the years that followed 1934, at least among the Lutheran clergy in Germany, we ended up with three groups. First, the Deutsche Christen, the German Christians, who became disciples of Hitler, who became Nazis. I heard stories that some of the Deutsche Christen actually put the swastika on the stoles and their clergy robes and sermons were written in Berlin and mailed out, which the Deutsche Christen pastors read on a Sunday morning. Then there were the confessing or the Bekennen de Kirche, those who were disciples of Karl Barth and the Barman Declaration who resisted Nazism and Hitlerism, and they were conscripted into the army, sent to the war front, and died. Not very many of them lived for the post-war peace. And then there was a third group, the group the Book of Revelation will call the lukewarm water spirit bit out on Judgment Day, those who just tried to hide. It was equally divided. There were about 18,000 Lutheran pastors at the time, 6,000 in the Confessing Church, 6,000 amongst the German Christians, and 6,000 wimps and wusses who just tried to hide from the conflict. Karl Barth church theologian, not a public theologian, responsible for the Barman Declaration that led to the creation of a resistance movement against Nazism. One of those confessing Christians was a Lutheran pastor by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He has a very complicated story, but he's a public theologian, not necessarily by ideology, but by the way he lived. He participated in a plot to assassinate Adolf Hitler. He was caught, placed in a concentration camp, and executed before the war ended. There are different ways to be a public theologian, ideologically or by putting your life on the line. In our current situation, the political task within public theology rarely requires putting your life on the line. Instead, the public theologian offers positive, constructive visions. I call it worldview construction. Most important is the vision of the common good. 
Take a look at what the Lutherans say about the common good. Today, the meaning of common good or good for all must include the community of all living creatures. That is to say, common good is not strictly a homo sapien ethical ideal. No, it has to do with the whole of planet Earth's living biosphere. The meaning also should extend beyond the present to include consideration for the future web of life. Not just space, all space on the planet, but time. You and I have a moral obligation to our grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and future generations whom we will never meet. We share a common good with them over time. The sphere of moral consideration is no longer limited to human beings in the present alone. The common good. One of the most significant contributions of the political theologian to public discourse is the lifting up of the common good. The dandy program for public theology comes from this article in the International Journal of Public Theology. Public theology, it's pastoral, apologetic, scientific, political, and prophetic tasks. If you think you can handle any more on this topic, <laughs> go read that. What is the practical means whereby the public theologian can engage the culture outside or beyond the church? I recommend two. The first is discourse clarification, hopefully the wisdom and insights gained from systematic theology will provide the public theologian with the kind of analytical tools necessary to examine existing public discourse in such a way as to reveal the religious depths that are presupposed, and hopefully any existing inconsistencies, self-contradictions, and lack of coherence, and provide, hopefully, explanations for human experience that make more sense, they're more comprehensive, and they're more adequate. The second is worldview construction. One of the ways of describing the current chaos that our psyches are challenged with through the internet, the mass media, and all of the ways in which the crisscross of communication is experienced is one of worldview competition. If you allow yourself to surf the net and out of curiosity explore the differences, you will be bombarded by uncountable competing worldviews, can the public theologian synthesize what is going on in such a way as to construct a more explanatorily adequate worldview than the competitors, a worldview that is oriented toward the one God of grace, love, and forgiveness. Forgiveness, discourse clarification, world.
view construction. If you want to be a public theologian, can you engage in discourse clarification or worldview construction? That'll be your job. Well, my cup. Empty. <laughs> Maybe yours is too. Bye bye. My soul cries out with a joyful shout that the Lord of my heart is great. And my spirit sings of the wondrous things that you bring to the ones who wait. You fixed your sight and your servant's bright, and my weakness you did not turn. So from east to west shall my name be blessed, and the world be about to turn. My heart shall sing at the day you bring, that the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. Though I am small, my God, my all, you will work great things in me. And your mercy will last from the depths of the past to the end of the age to be. Your very name was about to shame, and for those who would for you yearn. You will show your might, put the strong to fight, for the world is about to turn. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, as the world is about to turn. From the halls of power to the fortress tower, not a stone will be left on stone. Let the king beware, for your justice tears every tyrant from his throne. The hungry poor shall weep no more, for the food they can never earn. There are tables spread, every mouth be fed, for the world is about to turn. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of your justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. Though the nations rage from age to age, we remember who holds us fast. God's mercy must deliver us from the conqueror's rushing grasp. This saving word that our forebears heard is the promise which holds us bound. To the spear and rod can be crushed by God who is turning the world around. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of the justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn. My heart shall sing of the day you bring, let the fires of the justice burn. Wipe away all tears, for the dawn draws near, and the world is about to turn.